find ourselves at war. And our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against fallen angels, principalities, and powers. We are here to liberate the oppressed. For I am a soldier in the army of God, and I will never desert a fallen comrade. I will never give up, and I will never surrender, for surrender is not an option. I'm going to jump right into this uh, second uh, sermon or lecture on the family, battle ready or not. Or we could subtitle it, The Family God SWAT Team. Remember what SWAT means, spiritual weapons and tactics. I'm going to read to you from the current Soldiers' Creed. This is the creed of all of the soldiers in the United States Army. It uh, comes from Army Chief of, Chief of Staff General Peter Schumacher. And I've just changed a couple words, and, and, and it's right to the point. In the Soldiers' Creed, it, it begins by saying, I am a soldier, and so forth. And, and you'll see where I obviously change the word here or there, but it fits our purposes. I am a soldier of God. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I serve the people of God and live the Christian virtues and values. I shall always place the mission first. I shall never quit. Surrender is not an option. I shall never leave a fallen comrade. I am disciplined, physically, mentally, morally, and spiritually tough, trained and proficient in my spiritual warrior tasks and skills. I always maintain my weapons, my equipment, and myself. I am an expert and I am a professional in the sure knowledge and practice of my faith. I stand ready to deploy, engage, and destroy the enemies of God and of souls in close and immortal combat. I am a guardian of the glorious freedom of the children of God and the Christian way of life. I am a soldier of God. I'm going to go back through it. Whether you like it or not, believe it or not, every one of us is a soldier in God's army. If you're not, there's only one other army you can be a soldier in. <laughs> you know, the guy with the horns and... Right. You don't want to be in his army. Not good. I am a warrior and a member of a team. Now, my friend, Master Sergeant Michael Couton, who's with me to help me this weekend, and the members of his Operational Detachment Alpha, or A-Team, 12 men in the Special Forces, they just came back uh, from Iraq. They were over there for a tour of duty. And... You know, they, they, as soldiers, profess this creed. They performed an enormously valuable service for us, but I want you to think about the enormously valuable service we provide for each other in the spiritual order. Now, this war I'm talking about is the war to end all wars. It wasn't World War I. My grandfather was a sergeant in the Army in World War I got blown off of his motorcycle half a dozen times, mustard gas. Then World War II, my dad was in the Navy. He got blown out of a Jeep in the South Pacific, had a, had a plate in his head for the rest of his life. Another uncle went to Korea, my generation Vietnam, Mike's generation Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, 
soldiers. You are a soldier, and so am I, fighting in a spiritual war. It is the war to end all wars. You, have to, you don't want to lose this one. This loss would be eternal. What I'm talking about is eternal life and eternal death. Those are the spoils of victory, win or lose. Now, nowadays, people don't like things quite that stark. They struggle with that. That is a sign of our weakness. There's not something wrong with the truth. If a person can't handle the truth, there's nothing wrong with the truth. There's something wrong with that person. And they have to get over it. We are warriors, whether we believe it or not, like it or not, think that way or not. We are St. Francis of Assisi, one of the greatest saints in history, was shown that he is a warrior. Now, he was a great man of peace, a great man of peace. But he was shown that he was to be a warrior. Who did he war against? Satan, in plain English, the devil. Now, whenever you say that, you know, as a, as a Catholic priest in the 21st century, talking to large groups of people, I am very well aware that many people, once you, do, once you talk in that fashion, uh, they will tune you out as though you were out of your mind. One time I had a very, you know, for lack of a better term, liberal priest get in my face say, and say, did you ever see the devil? And I said, many times. <laughs> many times. And he went into a diatribe about how the devil doesn't exist and it's just a figment of medieval imagination. And I told him I would pray for him. And he scoffed and laughed. This was at a conference that night Oh, it was about, it was in the morning, 3 a.m., I heard a blood-curdling scream. As it turned out, it came from him, in his room. They found him in his underwear, cowering under the tabernacle. That's where he ran. Later, I asked him if he'd ever seen the devil. He turned absolutely white and couldn't answer. It's real. It is absolutely real, and it comes in ordinary ways and extraordinary ways. I am a warrior and a member of a team. I don't fight alone. I'm a member of a team. Mom, your A-team is your family. Dad, kids. You're a member of an operational detachment alpha. And you're all specialists. You've got 12 men on an A-team. And they all have areas of specialization. Uh, you'd have a weapons sergeant, you'd have, a, you'd have a, a medics, you'd have communications, and so forth. It's no different in the family. Mom, you have your job. Dad, he has his job. The kids have theirs. Everybody has their spiritual task, but you're a team. You're a member of a team. Now, I'm going to just say this as forcefully as I can. Let those who have ears hear it. Now, Mom, I told you before, women, you've got power. You've got power in the family. Dad has power, too. But you've got, you've got power probably more than him. <laughs> I don't know about every family. I just knew about the one that I grew up in. My grandfather went to work, made all the money, came home, and guess who got it? <laughs> right, Grandma. And, and she ran the household, and that's the way it was in the old days, you know. Member of a team. Now, let me say this as clearly and as forcefully as I can. You must... You must pray together as a family. I know there are a million and one excuses why you can't. Your husband may not want to. I know it's not your fault. 
I know it's not your fault. In my experience, and from my very wide reading of history, I have learned that women are very resourceful, very intelligent. Women know how to figure stuff out. Believe you me, if you can't do it one way, then there's another way. They'll figure it out. And so what I say to you is, figure it out. You know, Dad, oh, he doesn't want to pray. He won't pray the rosary. Listen, Mom, you're clever. You're intelligent. You know how to do it. Find a way. You must pray together. Mom, Dad, and the kids. I remember my great-grandfather. I've often told the story. Up in Canada, my mother's side was half French-Canadian. We'd visit up there every year in the summer, and religiously, I mean every single evening after supper, my great-grandfather led the family in the family rosary. And I mean, you, you have to understand what it was like back in those days. It was different than today. There was no negotiation back then. <laughs> my my great-grandfather was a simple man. He was a carpenter, a master carpenter, about not very tall, five foot eight tall and about five foot eight wide at the shoulders. <laughs> and he was like a, a, he was built like a rock mountain, very strong man. After supper, the dishes were done and great-grandfather announced, now we'll pray the rosary. There was no fanfare. Uh, there was no negotiation, bargaining. Now, we'll pray the rosary. And so it was. Every single night, 365 days a year, and I don't care if you were 8 or 80 in his house, you did it. He had a Jewish friend come one time, and by golly, that Jew played, prayed the rosary. He did. And he, and he didn't mind it either. He said so. I'm not telling you to be abusive, overbearing, but you know, your mom. When, when, when you put your mom hat on, you know, you know what mom is spelled backwards? Boss. <laughs> Men and women have abdicated their authority all too often, grown weak in the knees. I'll give you an example. One time I was preaching, finished preaching someplace in the south. It might have been Tennessee or Mississippi, and I, I went to dinner at uh, some lay people. I think it was a, a physician and his wife invited me to go, and they had people from the, the organizers of this conference. It was, uh, I think, around May or June. Uh, I know it was because it was prom time. And uh, he had kids, so I got there to have dinner, and there was a family discussion going on and the um, the daughter he had a beautiful young daughter I think she would have been about 17 and um, the discussion was about going to the prom she wasn't a senior yet but she was, was invited to go to the prom by an older boy a senior boy and there was a discussion going on in the family and well there was an argument going on in the family you know Mom said, no, I don't want her going out that late in a car, blah, 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 blah. She's too young. And dad said, oh, well, it's not that bad. And I walked in just at that moment in the argument, and they turned to me and they said, what do you say, Father? <laughs> Actually, it was the sweet young thing who turned to me and said, what would you do, Father? And smiled sweetly. And I said, honey, if you were my daughter... I'd lock you up into a closet till you were 39. <laughs> now, I realize you can't do that. But you have to exercise some discretion. 
as parents. And by golly, don't let the pagan world dictate to you what you're going to do with your children. You've got to have some backbone, ladies. And I know you do. You've got to have some serious backbone in this day and age. They'll railroad your children right into hell. And then you'll have to answer for it. So you better have a backbone. You know, if you don't have a backbone, you can't stand. No spine, you can't stand. What happens then? You won't stand for anything and you'll fall for everything. That's what will happen. You'll go with the flow and you'll get washed downstream with all the rest of the dead bodies. Don't go with the flow. You're a warrior and a member of a team. You've got to get your team ready. You've got to be battle ready. The family has to be battle ready. Can you imagine? If we sent a young man, say, say you had a son, 18 years old, and he enlists in the Marines or the Army, and they send him off, and they're getting him ready, you know, he's got to go to Afghanistan or Iraq. And, and he's got a, a training officer who says, well, you know, I respect your freedom, so, well, would you like to do some exercise this morning? No, I'd like to sleep in till about 10. Well, I don't want to impede your joy. Go right ahead. And, and he said, well, we've got to learn something about weapons. We're going to war here. So uh, we're going to have, uh, go to the firing range, and we've got to learn about how to, how to fire this rifle. And uh, would you like to accompany us, soldier? No. No, I don't, I don't like guns. I don't think I'll do that. I'd like to stay here and uh, crochet something. Oh, okay, well, I wouldn't want to interfere with your right to, to, to do what you want to do, and, and so on and so on and so on, and, and they ship out. What's going to happen to that boy? He's going to die. And the man responsible for his training is guilty of his life. One time, a woman went to confession to St. Padre Pio. And you know, they used to line up long lines to go to confession to Padre Pio. And so this lady got in line and she went into confessional, bless me, Father. And you know, she thought, what a wonderful thing, going to go to confession to someone who was generally considered a saint. Bless me, Father. And he leaped up and screeched at her and chased her right out of the confessional. She came back later, very upset. Why did you treat me in such a way? He said, because when you knelt down, God showed me your two sons who had died and gone to hell because you couldn't say no. And I was so upset. Another time, a woman came in and sweetly began, bless me, Father. He jumped up and chased her out. Why did you treat me that way, she said later. He said, because I saw in spirit the son you aborted who would have been one of the greatest popes in history. We are responsible. If you make a mistake, straighten it out. Let me tell you something. We've all made some major blunders in life, some of us worse than others. If your sins be as scarlet, they can be made whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. Listen, if you, if you made mistakes in the past, don't dwell on that. Don't cop out. Don't quit. No surrender. No excuses for quitting. No excuses for surrender. You make a mistake. Let me tell you something. Millions of times I wanted to quit. Well, you ought to know my past. Some of you do. I have no excuses, but I'll tell you what, I tried to cop out many a time and say, how could I be anything? How can I be a priest? I was a homeless, hopeless cocaine addict in the streets of Los Angeles, drug addicted, violent, lost. And God called me to be a priest, and I knew it. And the devil said, what a joke. Who do you think you are? You're garbage. I own you. And I could have quit. 
25 years ago, 20 years ago, last week. And some days I want to tell you something I'd like to. Most mornings, Friday mornings especially, when I get up about 3 a.m., go to the airport and do a, a mission, it's never gotten easier. I told Mike before, before I came out for the first talk, it's, it, I've been doing this for 15 years. In the last 10 years, I've flown two and a half times as much as Pope John Paul II did in 27 years. And he was the most widely traveled pope in history. To give you an idea how many miles I've gone, of course, he did a few other things. <laughs> I haven't done anything else. I've wanted to quit constantly. I can't. Can't cop out. No surrender. You're in this thing right to the bitter end, and so am I. And so we might as well get used to the idea. You've got to be battle ready. Your family has to be battle ready. Now, I know that it's hard after they get older, after the kids get to be teenagers, but let me tell you something for you younger ladies. Maybe you're not married yet or you're newly married. Please, St. Thomas Aquinas used to say an error in the beginning is an error indeed. You know, in the first place, marry the right man. Okay? Don't, don't marry somebody for the wrong reasons. I meet a lot of very nice young Catholic women. Every place I go, and they say, oh, but Father, I can't, I can't find a good Catholic man. Then, you, you know, you got to pray to St. Anthony. <laughs> right? He, right? When you want to find something, right, you pray to St. Anthony. And so, now look, girls, here's what you do. You just go to St. Anthony in church. Go to an Italian parish. <laughs> they always have St. Anthony. And you kneel down and you say, Tony, Tony, find me a man. Do it, please, as fast as you can. <laughs> and see, then you'll get the right one. So that's the first step. Secondly, after you got the right man, and say you have children, begin while, before they're even born. You know, the baby in the womb is a human being from the moment of conception. And in a mysterious way, that little human being, well, we know that, that's just basic fact. That little human being can receive certain things, including love, including indoctrination in religion. You know, before I was born, my mother took me to church every Sunday. Right? I mean, she went to church every Sunday. I went right along with her. I didn't stay home. <laughs> right? <clears throat> my, my mom went, went to rosary devotions, first Fridays, all that. Little Johnny, he came along for the ride. And don't you think he didn't profit from it? They do. Be aware. Be aware. That baby in the womb is a little person and can absorb things, love, rejection, all kinds of things. Act accordingly. And then when they're born, begin their formation. Pray together. I, I would put, I'd take the baby, I'd get my husband right by the ear if I was you, if, and, and we're going to pray the rosary, I'd put that baby right there, right, right in the crib, right there, so he can hear the prayer. You say, but he doesn't understand no prayer. Never mind, what, you don't know what he understands and doesn't understand. God knows. Just do it from the beginning. If you will do it right from the beginning, you will find out it's much easier when they're older. But if you don't do that from the beginning, it will be like pulling teeth to get teenage kids to do anything. Very difficult. We live in a morally toxic wasteland. Oh yeah, we've got air pollution. We've got water pollution, we've got noise pollution, but the worst pollution of all is moral pollution. We live in a morally toxic wasteland. 
and we seem to take it quite nicely in this country. Oh, I don't mean you personally, but I mean in general. In general. Pornography pollutes the moral atmosphere. It is found everywhere on the Internet. S stores in every city in the United States under the specious pretext of freedom. That's not freedom, that's called license. You know, better learn some language. There's a difference between freedom and license. Do you know, ladies, do you know what the word pornography means? It comes from two Greek words, ponaroi and graphia. Ponaroi, the devil. Graphia, pictures. Pornography, literal translation, the devil's pictures. Now, you can start there in your analysis of what that is and what that does. And I can tell you that there are more people addicted to it than are to heroin, cocaine, and marijuana combined, and it's just as deadly, morally deadly. It destroys families. It destroys the fabric of society. It destroys the individual enslaved by it. And we call it law. Well, uh, we shouldn't be surprised. We call abortion law, too. I'm going to tell you something. One day, the world is going to wake up as though uh, from a bad dream. And we're going to look at what we've done and be horrified. We will look back on it and be, if we ever have eyes to see truth, we will look at what we've done and be absolutely horrified at the crimes against humanity that took place in what was supposed to be the most civilized nation on the face of the earth. And Massachusetts will have much to answer for. You think 9-11 was something? 9-11 was a walk in the park compared to what's coming if we don't repent in a hurry. Repent, wake up, turn from our evil ways. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. It is absolutely outrageous what has happened to this great nation. And why has it happened? How has it happened? I think it's happened because so many of us were just asleep. Who could have foreseen it? Who could have foreseen what happened to the church through the 60s and the 70s? Wholesale defections from religious life and the priesthood very frequently. A great number of seminaries Catholic universities teaching things that weren't at all Catholic in doctrine and in morals. How did it happen? I think it ha happened more by being caught unprepared. We just, just couldn't have expected anything like that. We just assumed everything was okay. I'll never forget my high school science teacher, Mr. James Stiles. First day of science class, he, he walked into the classroom and he wrote on the blackboard the word assume. And he looked at us and he said, never assume. You'll make an ASS out of you and me. <laughs> never assume. Don't assume. You've got to think. And you've got to be defensive now. You've got to prepare. You've got to prepare your children, your grandchildren. Now, I realize many of you are, find yourself in a situation where you think it may be too late. You say, I just can't get them to pray. I, I can't get them to pray the rosary with me. My husband won't do it. My kids are running in every direction. You better, have, you better, take, you better take old dad and sit him down and have a serious talk with him and speak your peace. Tell them what's in your heart. Tell them that, that you, you're, you've got spiritual things that you've got to talk to him about. You're worried about losing your children. Let me tell you something. If you don't aggressively and actively form your children, train your children 
get your children battle ready, let me tell you who's going to get them. The world's going to get them with its disvalues. And, and look at the world. Just look at it. Just look at television. You want to see what this society is like. Pornography, abortion, violence, drugs. On and on it goes. I'd be praying day and night like you mean it. St. Paul said, don't, don't fight like you're shadow boxing. This is a real fight. This is a knockdown, drag out, bare knuckles brawl. You win or you lose. Heaven or hell, period, exclamation point. Don't be complacent. I remember I enlisted in the Army in April of 1967. The Vietnam War was heating up. I'll never forget it. I went to the recruiting center in Albany, New York, 18 years old, took the oath, got on a bus, and went to South Carolina all alone. I was motivated. You ever been motivated? Are you motivated to save your family, ladies? You've got to be motivated to save your family. I was motivated to serve my country. And so I enlisted in the Army. I went off, a kid, 18 years old, never been away from home before, got on a bus and went to South Carolina. Got off the bus and we're in the dirt, man, low crawling across the parade field. I remember Smokey the Bear. You know who, you know who Smokey the Bear? I don't mean the guy with the forest fire. I mean Smokey the Bear, the DI, the drill instructor. I had the original Smokey. He was about nine foot three. <laughs> Smokey lined us up, and the first thing out of his mouth was, ladies? That's what he said, ladies? I'm here so you don't die, because there's a war in progress. But I'm here to tell you, if you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight? And what he was getting at was PT, physical training. If you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight? And I'll say to you ladies, if your family can't even get to the battlefield, how are they going to fight? Now, he was talking about physical training, PT. I'm talking about ST, spiritual training. And boy, then it began. He would run us and run us. We'd run two miles, three miles, five miles. And that's just to warm up push-ups, sit-ups, 70-pound packs, rifles through the swamp, 30 miles, back long after dark, five minutes to eat, go to bed. You're so tired. I remember, I remember what exhaustion tasted like. It don't just feel like it exhausts. You can taste it. It is so pervasive. You lay down and you're unconscious. Three hours later, in comes Smokey banging on a garbage can lid. All right, ladies, get up. And you do it again, over again. ST. I'm talking about ST, not PT. ST, spiritual training. Ladies, if they won't do it, how are you going to get them to do it? You're going to pray. You know what Smokey said to us? Get your sorry backside out of that bed. And if we didn't do it fast enough to suit him, he turned the thing right upside down, made us do push-ups, and then we went out. What's it worth to you to keep your husband or your children out of hell? Get up four or five o'clock in the morning and pray for an hour? That isn't too much to ask. You say, well, I'm too busy to do it. You know, I got I to gotta take the kids to school. I got to do this. I work, and, and I sympathize with it. I know you're busy. You're heroic in what you do very frequently. But you must take that hour to pray. If you can go to Mass, do it. If you can't, pray the rosary. Have a place in your house where you go to pray, a little corner. My grandmother had a place. She, she didn't have a big house. She had, a, uh, they had an apartment. Two bedrooms, well, and another little teeny one. She had a corner of the living room where she put a little table 
with a nice cloth, and she had a crucifix, a statue of the Blessed Mother, and she'd get up 4 o'clock in the morning, and she'd go kneel in her corner and pray. Now, a lot of times she could go to Mass, and she did. Sometimes she couldn't, so she prayed. Mom, Grandma, ladies, ST, spiritual training. If you can't get hubby and kids to do it, you must pray for them. They won't do it for themselves. You do it for them. You do it for them. You do penance for them. You pray for them. And don't quit. Surrender is not an option. You know, you're going to be right there over dad's shoulder as long as he lives. Don't torture him. But you've got to get the family praying. ST. Now, you've been given a certain authority as a wife, as a mom. So use it. Authority is a fearful thing. You know, I think we've had uh, much of the breakdown today is a breakdown in authority. We've had weak leadership in many cases, at times in the church, at times in the political order. I once asked a very, very holy nun, a prioress, a Carmelite, Carmelite prioress. I said, Mother, why is it we're having such a terrible time, <clears throat> not everywhere, but a lot of places in leadership? <clears throat> and, and she didn't bat an eye. She said, that's easy, punishment for sin. Weak leadership is punishment for sin. You read the Old Testament. Whenever the, the uh, chosen people were unfaithful, what happened to them? No priest, prophet, or king. No one to lead them. That is punishment for sin. Got to offer reparation. Got to pray and do penance. You have to do this or nothing will change. I'll tell you a little joke. If the archbishop was here, he, he would laugh. Here's a story about a monk who dwelt on the mountain in the ancient days of the Desert Fathers. And he had a young disciple. Now, the elder, who was his teacher, frequently admonished the young man and instructed him to be diligent about praying. And he taught him and said to him, My son, uh, know that there is nothing worse for a monk than to abandon his prayers. And there is nothing that Satan, the adversary, wants more than for us to stop praying. Beware, my son, lest Satan prove too strong for you in the struggle. The elder exhorted the young monk and rebuked him, but he could not reform him nor convert him from his laziness and indolence. At that time, the brother died. The elder wanted to know what happened to him, so he prayed and did penance. And finally, an, el an angel came to him. And the angel led the elder up to heaven, and he saw all the beauty of the blessed. And then the angel led him to the other place where sinners suffered punishment. And there the elder saw various torments, and there was loud thunder, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Take heart, don't fear. Now you're going to learn about him who you afflicted yourself for in penance. So the elder's heart was comforted. Then he saw a huge cauldron, like a broad arc, and there was a blazing fire in it, and its flames were boiling up. And there were men standing in the cauldron, and some were in flames up to their neck, some up to their chest, and some up to the lower part of their belly, and others up to their knees, and then he marveled at them. And then there he was. He saw his lazy disciple standing in the midst of the fly fire with flames up to his belly button. And the elder said to him, Ah, my son, I was your teacher, and didn't I threaten you with this? I warned you, but you wouldn't listen to me. Oh, my son, how it grieves me to see what has befallen you. The elder wept, but the young disciple said to him, Ah, father, don't be weeping like that, because I can tell you something really true that will cheer you up. I am standing on a bishop's shoulders. And the moral of the story is, authority is a great gift, but a tremendous responsibility. Any authority we have been given is an awesome responsibility. Like the Cory of R, St. John Vianney said, I rejoice to be your brother as a Christian.
but I'm scared to death to be your father. He understood the weight, the terrible weight of responsibility. Now that is true for parents, it's true for priests, bishops, political leaders. It's true for all of us who have any authority whatsoever. It's a great gift to have authority, but every gift has a commensurate responsibility. And so we have to pray that we can live up to this responsibility. Do not allow the world to form you to itself. Don't allow the world to beat you down and wear you out. No surrender. No giving up. Remember the soldier's creed, I shall never quit. Surrender is not an option. I'll not give in. Oh, but mom, everybody's wearing those mini skirts. Everybody but you. Oh, but mom, everybody's going to be at that party. Everybody but you. Sometimes it's hard to say no, but it's much harder if you don't in the end. I'm not trying to talk you into being a tyrant. I'm just trying to talk you into being prudent and responsible and not knuckling under to a pagan world. You know, if the world thinks you're crazy, you're probably okay. If the world thinks that what the way you're living and, and, and raising your children is archaic, medieval, you're probably on the right track. But if they, if they applaud you, if you're one of them, if you go with the flow, watch out. You may be called to account for the souls of your children. I may well be called to account for your soul. I think about that all the time. Now, I know that I'm not perfect. And people tell me periodically, oh, you should have said this, Father. And maybe I should have. And you shouldn't say it that way. What, what, somebody took me to task last week and said, no, you're, you're doing it all wrong. You know, you, sh you shouldn't be so tough. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. And in all humility, I told them, when you have tens of millions of people that listen to you, then come back and advise me. Because I do and you don't. Simple as that. By the grace of God, I've got people all over the world. 110 countries get my programs. Millions of people. And I'll tell you, I get thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of communication. 99.9% .9 of it is positive. Once in a great while. I'll get something negative. Very, very rare. Very rare. Well, part of the reason is, you know, if somebody asked me, what's your response? You know, they were kind of incredulous. Well, when you preach all over the place, what's the response of the people? And I'm just being honest. Overwhelmingly supportive. Of course, the other guys don't invite me. That's the secret there. <laughs> That's not very hard to, to figure that one out, you know? One of the things in fighting any war, being a warrior, an essential thing, I, I've noticed this, by the way. Remember, I, I told you, I've, in my life, been fortunate to operate in many different spheres of human activity, from when I was young in athletics, from when I was, oh, my, almost 19, 18, 19 in the military, college, the corporate world, law enforcement, the church now, it's all the same in principle. Oh, there are differences in the details. The principles are all the same in every human activity. Winning has the same principles, no matter what you're doing. Losing does too. Losers always blame somebody else. 
Losers are always complaining. Winners take responsibility. I don't know if they still do it, but in the old days at West Point, when a cadet was reprimanded for doing something that wasn't up to snuff, he had one response. You know, his shoes weren't shine, or his brass wasn't shine well enough, or maybe he didn't salute well enough. One response. No excuse, sir. No excuse, sir. Memorize that and live by it. No excuse. You know, the Army's motto is be all you can be, the recruiting slogan. Be all you can be. Now, I have it on good authority that the Army stole that from God. Jesus said, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be all you can be. That's good advice. Demand excellence. Nothing less will do. I'm not saying be a tyrant, Mom. I'm not saying be oppressive, Dad. But you have a right to demand excellence. Nothing else will do, and nothing else befits your child. They deserve that. They deserve the help to be all they can be. We live in a lackluster generation for the most part. We make too many excuses. Take our ease. And we've been slipping. We are slipping. There are other countries that are actually ahead of us in many, many areas. And that didn't used to be the case. Where is the breakdown? The breakdown's in the family. Oh, but they did this at school and they don't do this at school. Well, who makes up the school? Whose kids go to that school? Yours and the parents. Next. Starts one at a time. I remember seeing a, a documentary on an airplane one time. I was flying and they showed a thing. It was a, an African-American man who had been a high school principal, I believe it was. They put him in an inner city school, a horrible school where, that, that, where nobody graduated. It was just a mess. They put that guy in there. He was like that DI I told you about, that drill instructor. They put him in there and it was yes, sir, and no, sir. He demanded discipline, and he got it. He required excellence. He got it. They went to college. He turned that place around almost overnight. And what happened then? They reward him, give him a medal. No, the school board threw him out. Said, you can't act like that. And so then he got a job running a, a home for wayward boys, kind of a reformatory type place. Put him in there, that place was a mess. It was chaos. Constant rebellion and mutiny in the ranks. No respect. And those kids just went out to lives of crime. That didn't do them any good being in there. They put him in there. He demanded respect and he gave them respect. It's yes, sir, and no, sir. And it's Mr. Jones, and he called them Mr., whatever their name was. Mutual respect, not optional, required. The breakdown of discipline is the demise of a nation. And we have broken down because the family has broken down. I was in the grocery store not too long ago, and there was a kid, 14, 15 years old, had a fight with his mother in the grocery store, and he cursed his mother out in that grocery store with language I mean, I've heard it all, but I, I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I, I, I went out of there. I, I was, I, I wanted to grab him up by his narrow little neck and shake him a little. I, I forced myself not to, and I, but I walked out shaken by the experience.
And I thought back to the days. Now, I understand that teenage boys can go through difficult times, you know, with hormones and with, with emotions. I understand that. Uh, and you have to understand it. But I, I think back, and I had a rough time when I was a teenager too, but I think back, God help me. If I had ever even, I, I, it's inconceivable. You know what I'm talking about, because you, you grew up then too. It's inconceivable. If I would have ever even looked at my mother cross-eyed, but that kid, oh, never mind my father would have killed me, my mother. It's serious. We have a real breakdown in discipline, and I'll tell you one of the results. It's not immediately evident, but one of the results of this breakdown in discipline is a breakdown in morale. Now, I see it most in the church, in the priesthood. Now, we priests, and you lay people and religious, we're, we're part of the same family. I don't have any other family but you. I don't. We have a breakdown in morale in general in the priesthood. It's horrific. An average priest is lucky if he has one good like-minded friend in the diocese. I don't mean this diocese, but any diocese, in, in general. Scandals wreaked havoc. And you know it better than most people. You are in ground zero. One time I had a woman come up to me when all that was going on back there in Lent. She grabbed me right by the, I was dressed in clerical clothes, she grabbed me right by the lapel and she said, I'm mad at you, priest. And I said, so am I. You don't have to dress this way in public. I do. When I entered this, it was perfectly respectable. And now you feel like you've got to hide your head in public. Three times in my life I've been spit on. The first time I was 19 years old basic training. My best friend was a black man. And we went home on leave to his mom's house in Atlanta, Georgia. We went from Anniston, Alabama to Atlanta, Georgia. We hitchhiked. 1967. A black man and a white man hitchhiking from Anniston, Alabama to Atlanta, Georgia. And it didn't take long for the pickup truck to stop and the good old boys got out. And one of them spit on me because my friend was a black man. And the games began. And that took about 12 highway patrol cars to break that one up. And the second time I'd finished my training, I was on leave before we were supposed to go to Vietnam. And I went home in my uniform and a group of I'm not sure what they were, protesting something, anti-war, I guess, but they took it out on me. One of them spit on me because I was wearing the uniform of the United States Army. And that one took half the police in Albany, New York, to, to settle that one down. And then the third time, I was dressed in a different uniform. Somebody showed what they thought of priest. And that's the generation we live in. Horrible mo morale. You've got to pray for priests. We've got to pray for you. We're in this together. You know, I, I, I was angry too. I was very angry. My superior told me, why not offer a reparation? Why be angry? You know, being angry isn't productive offering reparation is. And so I began to do that right away. And repeat often, I'm going to give you a, a, a clue here how to handle things. This is part of your spiritual training. Whenever you see something you don't like, or even if it's horrific, 
And I'm not excusing any of those horrible things that took place. But whenever you see something terrible like that, whenever you see a, a criminal or, or a crime or an awful thing, you say, except for the grace of God, there go I. And if you can't say that from the heart, know that you're defective spiritually. And I don't care who it is that you're looking at, whether it's the lowest prostitute, drug addict, or murderer, you've got to be able to say, except for the grace of God, there go I. And that will go a long way toward healing your heart. You've got to be able to say that's called humility. That's the basis of the spiritual life. Except for the grace of God, there go I. It's part of what we have to do. In the family, you have to do the following. Mom, Dad, make sure your children have the sacraments. You know, I, for the life of me, I see Catholic people and some... They, 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 the baby's not baptized. You know, month old, two months old. So what are you waiting for? The second coming? You know, what are you waiting for? What are you thinking? Man, I was baptized when I was 10 days old. And that was a little late. Make sure they're prepared for First Holy Communion. Make sure they go to First Confession before First Holy Communion. And they say, oh, well, kids don't understand about sin. Oh, yes, they do. And besides that, the Vatican has said, first penance before, first communion. Confirmation, make sure they get all the sacraments. The sacraments give us sanctifying grace. You know what sanctifying grace does? It's life. It's a share in divine life. That's basically what it is. Teach them to pray. Teach your children how to pray. Teach them how to pray the rosary. By golly, love the rosary and teach your children from an early age how to pray the rosary. Why? You're teaching them the gospel. The prayer of the rosary is the prayer of the gospel. The 20 mysteries, 18 of them are right out of the gospel. The Our Father and the Hail Mary is in the gospel. That's where it was found in the gospel. When you pray the rosary, you're praying the gospel. What's that mean? Good news. What's the good news? Jesus. Jesus Christ is the good news. You pray the rosary, you pray in the gospel, you pray in the good news, you pray in Jesus, you interiorize Jesus, you become who you are, the body of Christ. That's what it is. And you can't get around that. That's the logic of it. Teach them to pray. Practice virtue and teach them the same. Teach them the meaning of true love, which equals sacrifice. No sacrifice, no love. Authentic love equals sacrifice. Teach them, mostly by example. And then you'll be preparing them. You'll be preparing the family. They'll be battle ready, and then when they're tested, when they have to go to war in this spiritual combat, they'll be able to survive and even prosper. And you will have done your job, and God will bless you now and for all eternity. God love you. I have been to places you can't even fathom. I have seen things you don't ever want to see. Don't you dare quit. Don't you dare lay down and quit. The catastrophes come and the natural disasters come and 9-11 comes and what's next? In case any of you don't believe in the existence of Satan, you better start believing. All the Osama bin Ladens and Saddam Husseins and Adolf Hitlers and Joseph Stalins rolled together aren't near the threat to national security that immorality Wake up, America. Wake up and repent.
To purchase the presentation you have just seen or any of Father Corapi's many other audio and video presentations, please contact Santa Cruz Media Incorporated at 1-406-751-1900 or visit Father Corapi's website at www.fathercorapi.com.